look like for light itself to be stretched out and slowed down. Idly he wondered how badly this broke physics, as time itself was bent to his need. New sources of light began to appear in the courtyard, these are dark red, descending down into the courtyard from the sun. It took him a moment to realize he was, perhaps, the first person in history to see X-rays and gamma rays with the naked eye. He created a new cell in his system spreadsheet, wrote up a quick formula with grade school math to track the rate at which time was decelerating, using the spell's ongoing mana expense as the variable, which for the sake of his sanity he was forced to assume was a constant irregardless of how slow he was going, an assumption he felt was reasonable enough given that it had continued to slow down even as he slowed down, relatively speaking, of course. Not long after that, patches of the scene in front of him faded to such a dark red as to be indistinguishable from black as his little bubble of time slowed down past the point where light waves were visible at all, even in their stretched out forms. Perhaps an hour or two later all light had ceased to reach his eyes in a perceivable fashion, and he was still slowing down and his mana expense was still dropping. Finally he reached what appeared to be some kind of stasis, the mana expense of the spell no longer decreasing relative to the perceived passage of time, and his clock said it had been some three hours. Great. He now had an eternity on his hands with which to contemplate his impending demise. He would have panicked long since had he not felt that he still had the reins of the spell, and known that he could cancel it at any time and snap back into real time immediately to face his death. So. Problem 1 He was facing an immortal, untouchable archmage more powerful than any being he'd personally seen so far, who'd taken about as damaged from their best attack as he would have from a light sneeze. Problem 1 all his allies were incapacitated or killed. Galen, down. Gideon, down. Tyro and Graves were in the ring, Talahas's status was unknown, the dragon team was, down, a bit soon for that one, and their guide, Pembroke had gone to pieces, definitely way too soon for that one. Dot problem 3, apparently, he had had to go to the bathroom before casting the spell and now he apparently was stuck needing to pee for the entirety of the spell. Problem 4, he actually had no idea what he could do to escape the archmage. The man's reaction time was insane, faster than a railgun. In point of fact, there was no real reason to suspect he hadn't been using some kind of mental acceleration spell akin to what Oliver was doing now the whole time. Fortunately, Oliver had science, a still frankly ridiculous amount of mana and a lot of time to come up with a plan on his hands. With these luxuries, with having seen the Archmage's shield, and having just done the time trick himself, he pondered. Eventually, the last pieces clicked into place, and he realized what the Archmage's secret was. And so as he dwelt in the absolute and lonely darkness of an eternal moment, he devised a plan to kill the immortal Midge and save two worlds, and tried very hard not to think about the fact that he had to pee. Oliver had once had the opportunity to experience white torture during a training exercise. A form of psychological torture, it involves placing the captive in a white room and leaving them there, deprived of all stimulation, until they go crazy from the lack of input. It was a violation of human rights, horribly illegal, and, well, just horrible. Oliver had experienced it for what had felt like close to 12 hours, with nothing to do but wait for the time to pass. When they let him out, they told him it had been about two hours, but they could have told him it had been a full day and he would have believed them. Within a matter of minutes of entering into complete darkness, he realized that this was worse. Far worse. There was nothing he needed to do, or even could do. He didn't need to eat, or sleep, and he couldn't go to the bathroom. If it weren't for the system, he would have given up almost immediately and gone to his death convinced it was the better option. The first thing Oliver did was summon it and set it to track the passage of time. Though he could not track the passage of outside time to construct a ratio, he was confident that such a ratio would have been meaningless anyway. Once light started doing funny things, normal ideas about time sort of stopped being relevant. No, it was more of a reassurance for him, a way to orient himself to know that time truly was passing, and a way to distract himself. But by the 12-hour mark, once he'd realized the Archmage's secret, 
he was itching to cancel the spell and launch a counter-attack on him. Anything was preferable to this interminable, silent, lonely wait in the dark with what could only be a quick and violent conclusion one way or the other. The trouble with that was that if the attack didn't work, the Archmage would probably decide he was too much of a threat to be allowed to live, or at least go system free, and either immediately kill him or disable his system. No, he had precisely one shot at this, and he had to get it right the first time. That meant he had to be able to prove his conjecture beyond a shadow of doubt, and then come up with a surefire plan to get around the Archmage's wards and take advantage of the weaknesses it came with. So instead, he resolved to wait until he was ready, plan out his attack, come up with contingencies, and take full advantage of all the time he could. The second wind spell would run its course, although he could bend it, he couldn't divert it from its true purpose and once all the damage to his brain had been repaired, it would automatically cease, snapping back into the real world. He wanted to make the most of the advantage it conferred until then, and he wasn't going to give up because he couldn't handle a little boredom. When the hallucinations started, he was understandably distracted at first. It's a known fact that in the absence of sensory input the mind will actually hallucinate, because it operates by extrapolating data from the input it receives and if it gets only a little or no input, its extrapolations are wildly off. The problem was, Oliver reflected, we don't realize how much sensory input there is in the world around us. Even in the quietest place we can find, there's always something going on. When it was quiet enough, Oliver had always been able to, at the very least, hear his own heartbeat and the passage of air through his chest. In here, there wasn't even that. It was true silence, akin to the silence of space, a silence no human has ever truly heard. He was making all kinds of records today. He wondered if Guinness would take his word for it. First human to see X-rays. First human to listen to the sound of silence. First human to lose their grip on reality in less than a day, it was for the sake of his own sanity, and absolutely not at all just for entertainment that before he devised the full extent of his counter-attack, he abused a quirk of the system. If it could make sounds, could replicate the sound that the turning of a page made, as it had with his Dungeons and Dragons player's handbook, surely it could replicate other sounds from his memory as well. Sounds the system could play into his mind to fill the void caused by the absence of stimuli and quiet his mind, thereby allowing him to focus. Sounds like staying alive by the Bee Gees released in 1977 and reproduced in the highest possible fidelity by a Goldring forward slash Lenko GL75 record player pushing tunes through his father's old Wharfdale Linton heritage sound system. A song he'd listened to scores, probably hundreds of times. Upon reflection, and after a particularly harrowing period where the auditory hallucinations resolved into what could have possibly been the sound of screams in the distance, he informed his system in no uncertain terms that this would be possible. Carefully, Oliver visualized the way his interface would expand to include a music column. With scarcely any effort at all, the system helpfully obliged, the rush of blood to the head and kaleidoscope of lights that he hadn't seen for so long coming back easier than ever before, and staying for a troublingly long time. He'd begun to think he'd made a serious mistake making a modification to the system in this headspace officially both his literal and metaphorical term for it, when it finally began to die down. When it settled, nothing had changed, except the addition of two columns in his spreadsheet, songs, which was simply an atrociously long list of what was perhaps every song he'd ever heard, and a cell titled currently playing. And there was one more little option that hadn't been there before, a speaker icon. Currently, it was ticked off. H.M. Interesting. He scanned the list for several minutes until he found the song he was looking for, then copy and pasted it with a couple of mental flexes into the currently playing column. And then, in glorious high fidelity, Barry Gibb belting out the lyrics of Staying Alive in his trademark falsetto shattered the silence and dispelled the auditory illusions plaguing him. Blinking along happily to the tune, for he could do nothing else, Oliver reviewed the facts, and then his hypothesis. Taking the time to jot them down into a new sheet in his system for clearer analysis. Facts the Archmage was impervious to physical damage most of the time, 
but sometimes allowed spell effects and physical effects to pass through his physical form. That physical form, then, was an illusion of some kind. Explained the cape not respecting gravity. Mana couldn't travel far. He was close by, then, but not there, exactly. He could bend space in some way. The shield he created to defend against the dragon had created a warp in reality. There was a chance that it had been some sort of creation and then destruction of some sort of material with a unique refraction index, but materialization of pure matter would have been cost prohibitive even if you had nearly unlimited mana. And though the Archmage was powerful, he was no god. So naturally, that meant he was just twisting the structure of the space-time continuum instead. Magic was weird. Aloman was there, but not there, his physical body, then, could only be located in a pocket dimension, like the one afforded by a spatial storage ring. There had to be some kind of connection to the physical world that let him convey himself and maintain interactions with it. That was the primary problem with the storage ring, if you got inside of it, you couldn't move it around. It seemed like Aloman had solved that, to the benefit of his reputation. He was still able to interact with the outside world as if his body was fully present, that would have to be by means of force spells, similar to what they'd done at the range. He still had to breath. The Earthling's ability to create air within the spatial storage rings was, as far as Oliver knew, unique. Nobody quite knew how to create air from scratch here. He hadn't been harmed by the flashbang, or the nerve gas, therefore, the passage of air and light through this hole were filtered in some way, perhaps a sort of custom tailored force ward fitted over the hole. Conclusion The Archmage was standing in a pocket dimension, projecting a physical image of himself out into the world via an illusion spell, by redirecting the light, or something, and casting force and shield spells to simulate his physical presence. And, most importantly, there had to be a hole where his reality met the physical one. The illusion of invincibility was a potent one. It had head off most engagements before they even began, if you couldn't even hit somebody, why would you start a fight with them? It neatly explained the legends told of the man, Oliver would have never seen through it had they not already developed their own similar system with the range's illusion chamber. But they hadn't thought to take it so far. But the necessity of a portal between the home plane and his own pocket dimension explained why he went to the trouble of putting up shields at all. If you wanted to defend a particular unremarkable small spot that was your sole point of connection to the outer world, you'd pretend that there was a lot more to defend, and hence a lot more for your enemies to target. The obvious solution was the nuclear option figure out where that hole was, and unload all they had on it. And since Aloman was mostly existing in a pocket dimension, that, expanded their options. Specifically, it made Oliver's nomenclature of the nuclear option both metaphorical and literal. The fission spell was the natural culmination of a partnership between Oliver, Gideon, and Sung Lee into investigating the uses that transformation of materials, alchemy, could be put to. Gideon and Sung had shouted him down, but Oliver's argument, that it was better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it, had prevailed, ultimately. The issue was, it was basically a suicidal spell. The mana required to cast it meant you had to be within at least 30 or 40 feet to pull it off. They had transmuted the required uranium isotope, could fabricate the additional materials, the technical parts of it were no challenge. But none of them wanted to cast it. Given the two requirements for casting it were both the death of the caster and the massive amount of widespread devastation that could be its only object. But the situation was different here. If the nuclear reaction occurred in a different dimension, well, it would be safely contained, with the natural exception of any emissions from the hole between dimensions. Altogether, the products of the spell would be much less dangerous and certainly less suicidal than casting it in open air. It was possibly the least practical way anybody had ever thought of using a nuclear bomb, but it was also the one way Oliver currently had of being absolutely certain that the midge was dead. The problems with it were twofold, if something about his understanding of the pocket dimension were off, or if he failed to direct the spell properly through the hole joining the two dimensions. The results would be so catastrophic that he'd never have the time to realize his mistake. 
and the Mitch would probably walk away unharmed. That still left the matter of uncovering the hole and breaking the ward placed on it. That, Oliver had no idea how to do that. There was really only one thing standing in the way of Oliver Grace and his returning home to his probably still pregnant wife and his probably still unborn child, it was named Archmage Aloman, and it was as close to an immovable object as those who are numbered among the living can aspire. Oliver had considered a number of different plans and ideas, and finally had been forced to conclude that his plan with the nuclear spell wouldn't work at all. Its success hinged entirely on him being able to find the hole that the Archmage's dimension was joined to reality by, a hole which could be quite small, was probably concealed, and would certainly be warded in nearly as many ways as there were wards, and also being able to find a fail-proof method of threading his own manner through that hole. The failure mode for his setting off the nuclear device without being able to find the place to stick it was death. The failure mode for not being able to find the portal, and therefore not getting to set it off at all, was also death, if only delayed a little later. He tried a hundred different plans, and come up with ways that each one of them would fail, more ways than he was comfortable with. In the end, Oliver was forced to conclude that there simply wasn't a way to reduce the uncertainty to a point where the risk was worth taking, there just wasn't. It was time for a new strategy, the only option he had. Left at this point, and though it terrified him more than he would ever admit to himself, it was also the only chance he had left at finding a certain solution. He would have to modify his system again, see if he could mold it into a form that would grant him some other advantage. He couldn't imagine what that advantage might be, couldn't see much beyond risk, but knew as he had known the last time that he'd modified his system that there was little other choice. But this time, he was forewarned, and therefore forewarned. He wouldn't be going in blind, this time. After a little trial and error, Oliver developed a formula that would roughly calculate the amount of mental effort, determined by time elapsed, that it took him to realize a modification in the system. It scored each change by the amount of time, the magnitude of each change factored into the amount of effort it took to change it, and the time it took to effect the change. It was an imprecise thing but he felt a little better having taken what few precautions he could instead of blindly rushing into the very thing that had nearly killed him multiple times already. With nothing left to do and no ideas left to pursue, Oliver began to modify his system, slowly and methodically. His initial aim was to dismantle his current view so that he might replace it with something else entirely. It wasn't how it had worked before, where he'd simply ripped it out wholesale and let the magic determine what would replace it, instead, he hoped for a more controlled approach. He started by dismissing the spreadsheet entirely, leaving only the music column and the mass of data floating in an amorphous form in the darkness. Then he dismissed that data too, and kept going, throwing away, dismantling each piece of the system that had kept him alive thus far. Soon he was left with very little except the music buttons. Eventually, hesitating, he dismissed that too, readying his mind for the existential horror of the total void once more. A moment later, once the kaleidoscope of lights had dwindled away, he was left in the darkness, unable to see, feel, hear, or touch anything at all. He dismissed his system entirely. Then he waited stealing his nerve for the transition he'd known he would have to make, had known from the very beginning he would have to do, yet hadn't admitted to himself or really allowed himself to think about, he would have to dismiss this level of the system entirely, get back to, what had Madame Carrix called it. The underpinnings. The layer between the everyday interface and that pure stream of data that had consumed him the first time. Procrastinating, Oliver checked the tracker formula, noting that even as he'd done it just now, it had gotten progressively easier to shuck off pieces of his interface, indicating that it had become progressively less stable as the certainty that bound his concept of the interface to reality fell. Oliver gave himself a moment's time to think about his wife and child, to dwell on the joy of their existence despite whatever might happen to him, in what might potentially be the last moment of his life. And then, with a mental flex and a wince, he dismissed the interface entirely, willing that sublayer he'd seen only once before to come to the surface. It happened suddenly, easily, and he was then surrounded by a deeper void. 
He had been drawn entirely into the interface, as before, as that one time inside the harpist's nest. He could no longer even blink, and all consciousness of his body, including, mercifully, the sensation of needing to go to the bathroom, had vanished. He was within the underpinnings again, except this time he had time, as much time as he needed to study it, and experience, the knowledge of what it was. Where before the system had simply been incomprehensible to him, the great star field of nodes that he was hovering as a bare consciousness within now became clear. Each of the points of light was a record of a spell, made up of the myriad experiences that had gone into forming it, as interpreted by the great spell that was the system itself. He was within the most incredible and powerful spell ever crafted, a spell that was informed by his experiences and others, and drew upon them all to bind him, a simple human, to a colossal library of meaning and intent that formed a purposeful means of interacting with that great being that was magic. It was only here, in this place beyond a place beyond time, with his body sustained by another spell, the second wind spell modified and twisted from its original purpose beyond all recognition, that he could solve the problem of the archmage. With time, he found that he was able to make sense of the vast web, each node glittering in that space representing as it did a spell. He dipped from spell to spell, noting that each one was bound to previous iterations of the spell, and found something familiar in the visions that each spell conjured, found that they were the same visions he experienced whenever he learned a new spell. Each vision, then, represented a particular iteration of a particular spell, its, heritage, ancestry. And that meant that each spell was bound to a previous spell and that spell references were what were being exchanged between people. It had been a spell reference that Tyro had passed to him, and he had unwittingly navigated that spell reference to trace its lineage. The spark spell that had found its origin in a human midge contemplating the manner forms that made up the breath of the dragon, and had subsequently been molded, modified by other mags until the spell had reached its present diminutive form, a lighter dot and then, pondering this, he realized that he knew what he was looking for, exactly what would destroy the Archmage no matter how powerful he was. His search began. For a timeless moment that could have been a day or could have been a year after that. He into spell after spell, learning, watching the development of magic, the history of this world captured in outside of time like a fly in amber. The visions formed him, changed him, and as he partook of one after another he found his knowledge of magic and manner increasing beyond bounds. Oliver no longer suffocated from a dearth of sensory stimulation, he was drowning in it. But each time he found himself unable to absorb more information, he withdrew from the underpinning into the soothing silence of the void. Soon he came to find the act nearly effortless, until he could switch back and forth with barely more than the conscious desire of it, until his mortal body became nothing more than an afterthought. He had a hundred bodies now, a thousand, a thousand thousand dot it was the kind of experience that a mortal mind was not meant to hold, and it would have destroyed him save that the supercharged and drastically modified second wind spell was healing the damage done even as he was inflicting it, empowered to repair the cell structures and the neurons according to the expectations formed by, and knowledge Oliver had learned through, mortal science. A neural net, an artificial intelligence that had been fed thousands of years of information on how the human mind was supposed to work in its healthy state, that had had time to nest and gestate within Oliver's mind and learn how he thought, and use its superhuman intelligence to make him not only more of a being, but more of himself, more Oliver, and even that would have failed but for that he was consciously directing it, choosing based on his own tiny fraction of lived experiences that nonetheless had the hold over his identity granted only by agency. It was like his first experience with the underpinnings had been, where he had become one with the pure stream of consciousness, only this time it was under control, it was under his control, and it was all by choice, and it was all directed towards one conscious end, destroying the system. Some tens of thousands of visions later, he at last found it, the thing he had been looking for, the thing he knew had to exist the Empire's latest incarnation of the system spell, the one that had been imprinted upon him. The spell that he now gazed upon was final expression of it all, the tail end of a thread that led all the way back to the first spell, Murdin's system, 
the sword of Damocles that had been long suspended above the head of all mankind in both this world and his own, and however many others might exist out there in the great unknown dot in witnessing the visions of its development he was privileged to watch as it imprinted itself upon him, as the unique spell form that carried within its whirling fractal patterns all other spells and even the previous incarnations of itself, imprinted itself upon his mind. He watched while his mind was rewritten by magic, even felt himself come to consciousness, dazed, in a beautiful glade in a forest, dressed in lawn care clothes and with a weed whacker incongruously grasped in one white knuckled hand. And then he was snapped out of the vision and back into the underpinnings, for it had come to an end, the spell having settled. The experience of dwelling within a previous version of his own body, re experiencing the odd phenomena that had accompanied his arrival in this world, was a truly strange one that was more like to deja vu than deja vu itself was. This iteration of the spell, this node hung within the great three dimensional graph that his mind and magic had co conjured up around him, it connected to another node, and that node connected to another, and so on, forming a long chain of connected nodes. As his mind raced along the chain towards what could only by the one inevitable destination, he found himself thrilling, even without a body to experience it, the human mind was still capable of emotion, and though his mind was much enlarged and changed by the experience, a human mind it still certainly was. By now he had learned much of magic had force-fed himself perhaps more knowledge and experience than any mortal man had ever had the dubious privilege of ingesting. Aloman's magics had long since become clear to him, advanced they were indeed, the youngest and greatest manifestations of an elegant system of magic that fed on itself and unlike Jormungand grew only greater in so doing, a system of magic impelled by the force of human intent and agency. Oliver saw that this world had long since had its singularity, only instead of bringing about self-conscious artificial intelligence it had granted a greater power and will to man's own imagination, a power and will it had used to inflict on itself only greater and greater horrors that it could only be by the barest chance this world existed at all, that its very existence hung on a thread. Dot, but he was torn from his ruminations by arriving with a suddenness at the end of his quest, the spell that had been the beginning of it all, the very first iteration of the system. It was immediately clear to him as he witnessed Murdin creating the spell that it would be no easy matter to disrupt. Dot, he watched through the ancient man's own eyes as, dark robed and dim of sight he passed down the first spell forms to his young apprentice. It had been a stroke of genius, or perhaps madness, that had enabled him to create the system. The spell was a simulacrum, a likeness, of his own mind, faithfully recreated by magic and mercifully bereft of consciousness. To create it at all had been daring, perhaps insane, a newborn mind that lived in a void with no senses to perceive or interact with the world was a horror which Oliver was uniquely suited to appreciate. But it could have been nothing else, for no primitive man such as he could have come up with the fractal, organic whirls of looping mana threads that so closely mimicked the brain patterns of a thinking being. And it was this fundamentally limited, yet artfully patterned spell that continued to grow as a mind, incorporating the apprentice's spells into its own knowledge and passing them on. The spells, memories, how else could they have been recorded, structured in such a way that another human mind could access and understand them, and therein lay the difficulty. The human mind was notoriously complicated, it was still largely unknown to even the science of Oliver's day, remove vast swatches of the mind and it might still function unchanged, yet a tiny piece might prove key to its functioning in some unforeseeable way. How, then, was the magical lobotomy to be accomplished? Oliver didn't know where to start, what to prune or what to add that might change the functioning of this vast mind, grown and bloated even farther beyond understanding than it had been at the moment of its conception, for it had grown to encompass the experiences of many, many lives. It was not long, dwelling in the vast darkness as he did, before Oliver arrived at an answer. If he could not destroy of a surety the spell itself, then he could disrupt its link to its owner the reference that Amid's mind had to any particular spell, including the original system spell, was the weak point, a single link binding a mind to a spell form. It was this link that manner itself traversed, Oliver saw it now, 
This link that bound the knowledge of the greatest mags of the past to the manner of even the simplest mind of today. Suppressing the manner link entirely was one thing, this was, he saw, what had been done to him multiple times, including by Polephans and, he now realized, the rune wards of holding cells in the Empire's war camp. It was done by brute force, overwhelming the manner of the target and their natural aura defenses to affect the mind directly. It disrupted the link between image and the system spell so completely that their mana would have no place to go, only build up within them until it reached the critical point of dispersion. Oliver saw straight away that doing this would be impossible in the case of the Archmage, his own mana was far too pitiful and scant to overwhelm that of Alomans, another way, therefore, was needed. He spent long thinking and dwelling in that space, spared from the vulgar needs of biology, his mind ranged far and free outside of time until at last he arrived at a solution which even his innate risk aversion was satisfied by, and his inner engineer found elegant, instead of destroying the system, he would simply show the enemy Archmage what it truly was, he would replace Aloman's system spell, with Oliver's own, the path of no interface at all, the path of nothingness, the path of the void. Oliver's mind could barely cope with the void system, formed as it was by science, logic and technology. Inundated by modern semantic structures and calcified into towering architectures of meaning and abstract systems that the world ran on. English, Mathematics, Physics, Logic. Excel. File Systems. Programming. The concept of the number zero dot these were all things that these primitive peoples did not possess things they could only crudely approximate by building physical constructs to mold their minds to their mean temples and paths and so on, things which barely allowed them to scratch the surface of the possibilities magic afforded. No, the Archmage's untrained mind would not long survive the ravages of the underpinnings, of that, Oliver was certain. That left only one thing, how would he grant him? The new spell. In the end, that too was simple. Oliver's research ended in an efficient explanation. Why was it that each time a spell had been granted to him it had been through physical touch? What had physical proximity and channeling manner to do with one another, it turned out to be a simple matter of economics. The less distance that manner had to travel to create an effect, the less expensive it was. And as manner was very valuable indeed, the people of this land had naturally found the most efficient possible way to transfer spell references reducing the distance the reference, encoded into a mana thread, needed to travel down to almost nothing. Physical touch. The mana would travel from the grantor's spell channels, to the targets, almost costlessly. That meant it was still possible to do at range, and this was not something the Archmage would have thought to guard against. How could the simple granting of a spell, a thing ordinarily only beneficial, be a physical attack? It was a simple additive thing, at most, a spell could only add to your opponent's capabilities, not destroy them. It wasn't an attack through magic, it was an attack on the Archmage's magic itself, a metamagic, an exploit. Nothing Oliver had seen of magic, and he had seen much, indicated this to be a threat the mags of this world had considered before. It would have been sad, but then again, none of them had had to deal with those attacks, XSS injection or DNS interception hacks. In a way, it was very like an autoimmune disease, Oliver himself would do very little, would merely convince the Archmage system to destroy itself, and it would oblige him, rending itself through its own strength. So Oliver had his weapon, the final iteration of the system spell that was his own destroyed system, and his vector, the basic means of transferring spells. And was thus satisfied. It was time, he thought, to end this. Dot. Coming out of the second wind spell was an odd process, for two reasons. It was slow, even after he'd ended the spell, time continued to travel very slowly from Oliver's perspective, though of course it would be speeding up at an imperceptible rate. The return from the underpinnings to his own senses was trivial, effortless, a process he'd undergone hundreds, if not thousands of times by now. The void had now become a place of some familiarity, had lost its terror, after the sensory inundation of visiting a thousand, thousand spells, he felt as if his mind would never again need stimulation. It had, he had, 
changed in ways that made it difficult to tell what he was anymore. The reds of the longest waves of light visible to him were the first to return to his sight, shifting slowly at first and then more rapidly into blues and then the natural colors of the dawn he'd left what felt like so very long ago. He saw the web of the Archmage spell reaching out towards him, formulated a perfect counter spell with all the leisure of a boy out for a long country walk on a Saturday. Afternoon. His body returned to him, then sounds, long stretched out things, moving from tones so low he couldn't hear them up as the vibrations returned to their natural lengths, like the Doppler effect on steroids. His own manner triggered as his body became once again his own, the web of mana lancing from his own fingertips to fully disrupt the Archmage spell. Without his system or his mana tracker, he couldn't tell how the rate of time was changing, so he could do nothing but be patient. Had it not been for the long period for time took to speed up, he might have been overwhelmed by the sensation. But patience was something he now possessed, and handling curious sensations was something he'd become something of an expert in by now. And then as if reaching some inflection point, time sped up faster and faster until suddenly it was moving at a normal pace again faster than he'd anticipated. But the spell he'd already begun snapped forward, and cancelled the Archmage's disintegration spell completely. The frown that he'd watched begin now fully spread across the man's face. The Archmage spun more shields into existence using spells Oliver had witnessed the very invention of. In that heartbeat, observing the patterns of mana as they wound themselves outward in forms more familiar to him now than the back of his own hand, he saw that the whole must have been the ring the man was wearing on his finger. It was protected by as many potent wards as he'd thought, justifying his decision not to use the nuclear spell. But it was not, Oliver saw with satisfaction, warded against the mere granting of another spell. What path do you tread? the Archmage asked curiously, his deep voice resonating across the courtyards. Oliver took a moment to stand fully, smiled self-consciously, and said I walk the path of the Metamage. The what? asked the Archmage, looking confused. Ah, uh, it sounded better in my head Oliver said, cringing, then triggered the spell granting spell at range, watching as the mana wended out from his fingers lazily, pierced the mage's defenses as if they weren't even there, it was not an assault spell for them to defend against, and connected with one of the mage's own mana streams. Oliver saw as the Archmage received his modified system spell, and when the newest version of the system kicked in, in the change was obvious, the man's image flickered in and out for an instant, and then was gone. The hole in reality vanished entirely, and then the courtyard was empty. I should have said Metamassa Oliver concluded with a faint sigh. Oliver stood there for a moment, marveling at how easy it had been in the end. Then, without warning, he was hit by a wave of hyperdense white mana streaming up all around him. The Archmage's manner. The rush of magic was overwhelming, the influx of sheer white crowding out his vision all around him until all he could see was the mana flowing to him, bubbling up to the surface dimensions from some layer of reality deep beneath their own dot for a heart-stopping second, Oliver thought it was an attack, that he'd failed and could do nothing save die now, so potent was it. Then he realized that the mana held no intent at all. Freed from its owner whose intellect and sapience had been destroyed, it had merely dispersed, seeking the nearest living mind as its host. Relief overtook him. A moment after that, after more and more kept coming, he realized that the sheer amount of mana didn't have to be an attack to be dangerous, it threatened to drown him in sheer quantity, overwhelming his capacity to take it in. He thought for a second that he would die from the overload, that something had to give, that the pressure was too much, then, something did give. Something deep within him, some part of him that he'd always known was there and never recognized, tore. A little, at first, then more and more as the mana rushed inside, through, and back out again, forming a never-ending loop circulating through his mana channels, into some, other place, he searched for it in the back of his mind and found images of a shoreless sea, lapping softly into infinity, and back out again into his body. He began to feel a buzz building, the manner begging to be spent, 
to be free. This much of the power in one place held a kind of intent of its own, as if it longed to transform into something else, needed to transform from possibility into reality. Oliver focused inward, seeking to bring the raging torrent into some kind of control, not knowing what he was doing, but trying through sheer force of will to hold the edges of the tear inside him together, to hold, he realized on some primal level himself together. The manner had to be spent. The Archmage's power was such that the mere excess, vented in the time of his death, threatened to tear Oliver apart, and would, unless he could form it into a spell. Buoyed by the urgency, he sought to cast some kind of spell, anything to spend the manner, and found that without his system he didn't know how to select or will one into existence. It was like he'd been suddenly bereft of a limb, so unexpected was the disability. Oliver tried fruitlessly to summon the system, to summon anything, do anything, and found himself unable. Of course. He'd ripped it away and had not the presence of mind to create a new construct now. Without pause he cast himself into the star field of the underpinnings, grasping for the first spell he could find, anything. It didn't matter what. The tearing pain in his inner being did not cease even in the underpinnings. It was only with the greatest of efforts that he could bring himself to focus, even his newly augmented sanity was in danger of slipping. If this was what it meant to be an archmage, to progress along the paths of magic, no wonder so few tread the path, lined as it was with danger. The first spell was a nothing, a sneeze of mana, the second would destroy this castle at his power level, and him along with it. The third spell he looked in on was powerful, laden with intent and meaning and ritual, would cost him much mana and that without destroying himself and his surroundings. He selected it, took hold of the mana and forced it into connection with the spell manually, visualizing it almost like hot wiring a car. The spell took hold, mana pouring out of him and into it. He backpedaled out of the underpinnings frantically, not knowing what he'd see when he came out of it. He scarcely knew what the spell would do, save that it was expensive, would suck mana out of him and relieve the pressure threatening to husk him. And so when he opened his eyes to the real world to find himself surrounded by a column of liquid gold light that surrounded his body and rose far, far above to pierce the dawn heavens like a sunbeam caught in time, he had absolutely no idea what it meant. But it looked really cool, so there was that dot nor did he fully understand what was happening when a moment later, an enormous golden eye opened in the heavens above them, so large that it took up fully half of the horizon. Cast into its sudden shade and illuminated only by the golden light, he found himself wishing he really, really knew exactly what that spell had been. Oliver gazed back at the eye. Confusion and terror warring for primacy so violently that he was left unable to do anything else save we slightly in disbelief. Time slowed to a crawl, metaphorically this time, rather than literally. The eye blinked. Then Oliver came to his senses and cancelled the spell. The column of liquid gold washing down around him vanished as if it were a faucet being turned off, flowing up into the sky and away from him and then the eye was gone as if it had never been. It had been only a fraction of a moment that the spell had been active, yet he had drawn the attention of, something. The eye had not seemed baleful nor overbearing, but had given off a serene, distant presence, the sense of being observed without judgment or even care, if anything. It felt rather like he imagined a child would feel, nonchalantly watching an ant colony going about their businesses in between classes. The gods were watching, it seemed and they, didn't care, Oliver brought his attention back to the present, found that the flood of mana had still not ceased, but had slowed to the point where it was only filling him up and replacing spent mana, instead of drowning him. He tried summoning the system experimentally again, half-heartedly hoping for an interface, something, anything. Yet nothing came up. The price of the path he walked. Even without the approximations of numbers to guide him, he sensed that he now held far more mana than he had ever thought possible, its power a raging torrent within him only barely contained within his newly expanded, something. He lacked the words for it. Madame Carrick's tale came back to him, of how she had expanded her own capacity for mana generation and storage by basking in a natural mana font for a year. And further, 
that it was impossible for him to grow his own capacity. He suspected he had proven her very wrong. Movement drew his attention along one side of the courtyard. A group of sodders approached, clad in grey plate armor, swords held at the ready. Their body language spoke to fear, terror, yet even then they held discipline. They had just witnessed him destroy an archmage without exertion and then summon the presence of a god to bear witness. He felt for them. Even so, Peace he said in a tone reminiscent of the recently deceased archmages, raising his arms. They flinched as one and scuttled back, save for the commander, whose outstretched arm held a sword pointed at him. Its tip was wobbling. Peace, I mean you no harm he said. I will tend to my friends, and go. You, you can't, this is empire ground said the leader, voice trembling. Despite all their fear, what they had just witnessed him doing. They had no idea that he was about as weak as a kitten right now, totally helpless without the time to reconstitute some kind of interface he could use in combat. And he had no shields up right now. Oliver was weak, and couldn't afford for them to sense it. So he bluffed. He smiled at the soldier and inclined his head gravely, willing him to see more confidence in his face than there was, and turned his back on him, going over to where Gideon lay motionless on the ground arms outstretched and head tilted at an unnatural angle. He went over to him, confirmed that the earthling really was dead, and reclaimed his ring. Within the ring he sensed a single person, the scientist who'd been studying the phoenix rite. The key to it all. The man was floating in the center of the space inside a wrought iron cage. Outside of the cage, an enormous amount of different goods, weapons, and items floated in some kind of order he couldn't make out at first glance. He'd never witnessed the inside of Gideon's ring, but it looked like he'd come prepared for just about everything. While the soldiers shifted anxiously from foot to foot, all watching him silently, he drew Gideon into his ring and went over to Galen and confirmed his death too. The big man bore the marks of blunt trauma to the head. The great force the Archmage conjured up having overcome his considerable physical reinforcement. He was certainly dead. The rest of his allies were unmistakably gone as well. Syndra was a pile of goo on the ground. Their guide lay bisected on the cobblestone. It was silent as he looked around the courtyard, decided it was time to go. He knelt and put Galen's body in the ring with the prisoner who he cringed to think at the reaction of finding himself sharing the ring with multiple corpses of a sudden dot then he looked around and considered the situation. The soldiers had shifted around the courtyard while he worked, quietly keeping their distance from him. None of them had said anything since their leader had tried his luck, and indeed beheld him with even greater caution than before. The closed gate, an enormous dark metal thing some fifteen feet across and split down the middle by a hairline seam, was right behind them, which left nothing for it. He approached them at a confident walk, not too fast, not too slow. The walk of a man who had the situation well in hand, who could obliterate any one of them as thoroughly he had the archmage, and with only a single catchphrase, two dot the soldiers parted silently before him, metal armor clanking harshly in the dawn light, hesitant to get too close. He passed through them not five feet from soldiers on either side, who turned silently to watch him as he went. He glanced casually around, once, without stopping, then put his chin up and forced himself to saunter through to the closed gate as relaxed as could be. Oliver looked back at the leader of the soldiers, who shouted something up to the battlements after studying his face for a moment. Whatever he found, it had convinced him that Oliver was not to be trifled with. After a pause, the gates opened slowly groaning under their own weight. Oliver then just walked out, noting that the structure of the entrance was almost like an airlock, with a second gate at the other side of the large chamber opening as well. As he passed out of the second gate, he glanced over his shoulder to see all of the soldiers following him, tensely shifting grips on swords, adjusting armor, shifting uncomfortably. As he exited the gate he could already see them murmuring to one another, a new legend had been born this day. A new archmage walked among them. He did not turn again. Some time later, once he'd passed beyond the outer wards of the, the Crucible, he stopped walking and began to think. They had flown here, 
so he was once again stranded in the wilderness, and now with the burden of dozens of unexpected refugees within his ring, not to mention Grace and the scientist. The first thing that he did was draw his fellow Earthling from the ring, where she was still hard at work providing oxygen to the rest of the inhabitants. Where are they? What happened? she asked, a dreadful knowing in her eyes. We gained free of the fortress at a high cost, Grace Oliver explained gently. What now? Her eyes were tearing up but her face was hard, and the resilience that had stood her such good stead so far on full display. We need to get back to civilization, to sung equals, and I need to rebuild my system. Rebuild your, system, she asked. What happened to it? Is that even possible? I'll explain, but the short story is yes, I think said Oliver. I'm currently holding an enormous amount of mana, not even sure how much, but I don't have the means to use it yet. If we can restore my system and grant me the ability to use magic once more in a controlled fashion, we'll be in much better shape. Fair she said. The captives are in no shape to exit the ring, so I think I'll have to stay in there and provide them oxygen, rather than expose them to the harsh environment out here. The wind whipped at their backs as they stood in the snow on the mountain top. In the distance the range perilous covered the whole horizon in every direction. Very well said Oliver. I'll draw you back into the ring shortly. But I'm going to interrogate the scientist once we find some kind of shelter. I'll want you there for that. Naturally she said. What are you thinking for shelter? We need to get out of here, in case the soldiers back at the crucible want to think better of their choice to let me walk free. There are more mags than just the archmage on guard she said. They may have let you go out of fear, but we can't hope it'll stay that way. Any suggestions? Gideon's ring held a concealment runes a engraved on an amber tablet that should serve, if you have the mana to power it. Oh, I have the mana to power it said Oliver scanning through the ring as he spoke. Moments later, his mind's eye settled on a set of eight tablets made of amber and engraved with different runes. He still hadn't learned the written run characters, and so summoned them all out before Grace, who picked out concealment, warning, and heating runes et unerringly. These should do she said. We just need to get from here as we can before sunset in order to throw them off of our mana trail. Then let's go said Oliver. If you can just dip in and out of the ring to provide oxygen, I think it makes sense for at least two of us at a minimum to be out here. Not sure I can do that. There are a lot of people in there, and I'm needed to convert the carbon dioxide into oxygen on pretty much an ongoing basis. In fact, I should be getting back in there shortly she said. Very well. I'll bring Tyro out, then, if you think that's a good idea do it. That way if something happens to you he'll be able to bring us out of the ring. It would be foolishness to bring everybody out at once, but we can't just leave you out here with everybody's lives in your hands on your own. Sounds good he said. Get in the ring, I'll pull Tyro out and explain the situation and then we'll move until dusk. She gave him a sharp nod, then stood waiting while he placed a hand on her shoulder, nodded back and popped her in the ring. In short stead, Tyro was standing in her place, looking around in a confused fashion. Oliver explained the situation to him and his face fell upon hearing two of the deaths of Syndra and Galen. You know that we're all family he said morosely after they had begun to walk. I don't know what I'm going to tell my cousin, Syndra's daughter. Oliver nodded, listening to Tyro while they walked down the mountainside. The violence of the morning fell into the past, cleared away by the visions of the mountain range they were in, sun glistening off of white snow until their eyes watered from the sheer brightness of it and the wind nibbling at their faces and ears. They were soon forced to bundle up and draw clothes across their faces and ears to preserve what little warmth they could. That night within the artificial warmth of the heating rune, within the security of the concealment and early warning runes, all of which Oliver had had to be very careful not to massively overpower, they interrogated the scientist. The man was in his forties, 
weak of chin and with watery grey eyes that immediately marked him as an intellectual of no particular rebel persuasion. His eyes widened as he reacted to being suddenly withdrawn from the ring to face Oliver, Grace, and Tyro, all of whom stared him down with stern expressions. Oliver took the initiative to speak, opening bluntly and not giving the man a chance to catch his balance. The Phoenix right. Teach it to me. The, the Archmage will come for, the man began to blabber, dried tears and snot around his nose and eyes speaking little of his personal strength of character. The Archmage is dead said Oliver sternly, taking a step forward. I killed him, by destroying his system. You, you destroyed his system, said the man uncomprehendingly. That's impossible. It's true said Grace, stepping forward. Beside her, Tyro only smiled, but his smile was one of an insidious menace that even Oliver who was supposedly on his side was impressed by. Do you want me to show you how I did it, asked Oliver, raising a hand. No, no, wait, let's be reasonable here said the man, glancing around and taking in their surroundings, a bare mountainside with nary a tree nor rock in sight, a cliff just beyond them with a sheer drop down hundreds of feet, it was quite a sight even in the near darkness of evening light. Oliver's feet ached as he took another step closer, the day's walking having done them in. Without the second wind spell, he was not able to heal them as he would have liked to, even though he had mana to spare. Then why don't you yield to me the spell of the phoenix right? The man took no more persuasion after that, readily handing over the spell reference to both Oliver, Grace, and Tyro, backups, and crouching down with secondary shudders of fear rippling through his body. Oliver, Tyro, and Grace looked at each other silently. Now what? asked Grace. How do we know it's the real deal? Well, we could test it suggested Tyro. Try to summon somebody else. I don't think, began Grace at the same that Oliver said absolutely not. We aren't going to summon anybody else to this world without being sure if we can reverse the spell. We need to get back to Sung and have him analyze the spell before we do anything else. Will we bring the scientist the whole way? Grace asked, turning to Oliver. Of course we will, on the off chance that he deceived us and gave us the wrong spell, or something like that. Is it safe to bring him? Grace said. Did you see the dried snot and tears on his face? asked Tyro. That's not the face of a man prepared to do anything to defend his secrets. That's the face of a man terrified for his own life and willing to do anything to preserve it. Indeed confirmed Oliver. We'll see no trouble from him. It's decided, then said Grace. We'll proceed back to the city on foot as fast as we can and then decode the spell and try to reverse it once we get back to Sung and the spell analyzer. The scientist looked up at that glancing from face to face. The spell analyzer, he asked, sounding confused. Who are you? Ephrasion. Kelvin. They all ignored him. What are you planning to do with my spell? The scientist persisted, despite the fact that they weren't paying him any attention. What does the analyzer do? Reverse it. What does that even mean, reverse it? If you wanted to kill somebody again, wouldn't a dagger do? Please? There was a certain heat in his voice that he hadn't even had while his life and his system were being threatened. The indignance of a master craftsman whose work was being impugned. What do you mean, comparing reversing the spell to killing somebody, asked Grace finally, confused. Well, isn't that why you came for me? I completed the spell. He trailed off uncertainly. You completed it, asked Tyro. The scientist's lips compressed as he glanced around uneasily, aware that he'd possibly just given them more information than they'd already had. Tell me now and speak plain, said Oliver, low and fast. What does the Phoenix right do? Well, I'd just gotten it to work, finally said the man after little prompting. Brought somebody back to life. Tyro took a step back, shock on his features. Gods above, man, you're joking. It works. The scientist straightened up, exclaiming indignantly, I, Arcules, would not jest about my own life's work. 
and if you kill me, you'll, you'll never know how it's possible. Oliver stepped forward and put him in the ring again immediately, glancing back at Grace and Tyro. This is a problem. The spell, it's not the one that brought us here, is it? Well, it could be both suggested the microbiologist hopefully. Like, if you're not dead it brings you here, if you're not, it brings your body and restores it to life somehow. That doesn't make any sense said Oliver. If it brings somebody back to life then does it require a body to work on? Or, what? There's one way to find out Tyro said, gesturing towards Oliver's ring. Ask him. When they summoned the scientist from the ring again he seemed more disturbed than before, pale and shaking. Upon being summoned, he immediately burst out, before they could even get a word in edgewise, you're from Earth, aren't you? They didn't respond and he backed up, looking from one face to another. He paled even further. Oh, please, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't know, they made me, and broke down into babbling, even more terrified than before. Oliver wasn't sure what he'd expected to feel when he found the man was responsible for plucking him from his life and depositing him in this place, but evidently the man in question expected anger to be the only response. Indeed, as Oliver looked at Grace, he saw that eyes were narrowed in anger. You. Spat, venom in her voice. You did this. He watched as Graves took a step forward, leaning down to squat in front of the prone scientist. You are a scientist, yes, she hissed between her teeth. He nodded, not responding in words. So you know what scientists do. We study nature, we learn from it, and we use that knowledge to further our abilities. He nodded again when she paused expectantly. The bitterness in her words was palpable. Back on Earth, where I came from she said, nostrils flaring, where I was taken from, I studied microbiology. Do you know what that is? No, of course you don't. It's the study of the living world too small to see, everything that crawls, squirms and oozes inside your body and on it, including your body itself. I liked my job. I was good at it. And then you brought me here. Away from my family, friends, my entire life. Oliver debated whether to stop her or let her continue. The man was frightened enough. But Tyro didn't seem inclined to get in her way, and Oliver didn't see the need to either. Yet. The more compliant the man was, the easier their job would be. And then I learned magic. One little bright spot in a world of horror. I learned what I could use magic to do to the human body, and, I have to say, for all the time you've had to study it, I'm not impressed. In a week's time I developed more new strains of diseases than you even know about here. She paused and looked back and up at Oliver and Tyro, noting their stoic gazes. I learned about ways to make your body eat itself alive. I learned about ways to recreate plagues that could destroy entire populations in days. I synthesized poisons that could kill you without even coming into contact with you, could convince their cells that they were already dead. He cringed back even further. And you know what? The difference between you and I. I didn't use them just to see what would happen. If he'd had a defense it wasn't going to be coming out, judging from the way he was quivering and frozen in place. But don't forget for a second that I could destroy an entire town from a distance without even using a single spell. Don't forget that I could make your body eat itself alive if I wanted to, that I could keep you conscious during the whole thing too. What, what do you want, he asked weakly, even more thoroughly defeated than he'd been after they dragged him out of the ring the first time, too terrified even to move, a deer in the headlights, if Oliver had ever seen one dot honestly. The whole routine seemed more like therapy for Graves than anything she wanted from the scientist, because it took her a second to catch her breath and formulate her next thought. Nevertheless, in that moment, Oliver stepped forward, put a hand on Graves's shoulder. She flinched at the contact. I think what my friend is trying to say he suggested gently, is that you should tell us everything you know about the spell and if you know whether or not it's possible to reverse it to send people back home. The scientist's eyes widened. Reverse it. Send you back home. 
Yes, yes, of course. I can explain everything. Listen, here's how it works. Graves rocked back onto her heels, mingled anger and surprise on her features as he began to garble out an explanation of how the spell locked onto a particular soul by referencing the caster's memories of them, and then snatched them from the point in time right before they died. Oliver listened with increasing incredulity as he described the way the spell would snatch them from their original timeline and bring them to the point in time the caster resides in. But, but that violates causality he said as the scientist wound down his explanation. You can't just take somebody from the place before they died and have them come back, that, that doesn't make any sense. They wouldn't have died at all in that case, so how would the spell even know where to look? We don't, ah, uh, we don't exactly know how it works admitted the scientist. It just does. And if you don't specify a target, well, every once in a while you get somebody, or something, from, somewhere else. We don't know where. So, what, you're telling me the spell just happened to randomly grab a bunch of people from my world all at the same time, over and over again? No, no, of course not, that wouldn't have worked at all. We learned the hard way, and quickly. The spell is random, you see, unless the caster has a memory of a particular person in mind. And the things it brings back, well, they aren't always human. We lost several of my colleagues discovering that. So what does having a memory of a particular person do and how did that help you? Well, once you get the memories, you just summon them. It was a genius breakthrough, really said the scientist, growing more animated as he got into the details of discussing his work. We just interrogated the prisoners, ah, uh, ah. Uh, the Earthlings, found their memories of other people from your planet, and used those memories to summon those people as well. It totally overcame the whole randomness issue, and believe me, that was a major hang-up at first. Oliver struggled to wrap his mind around what the scientist was saying, they'd kidnapped and tortured people, into yielding their memories of friends. Family. Acquaintances, knowing that to do so was to condemn them to the same fate. Along with just about everything else in this world, it was pretty awful. Look, can it be reversed? That's all we want to know he said after a moment, running his hands through his hair. As terrible as that line of thought was, it wasn't as important right now as figuring out what they needed to do next. What they could do next. Yes, it can, but it's expensive said the scientist. That's why we set up shop here, at the Crucible, of course. One of the largest natural mana wells ever found. You'd need the mana of an, archmage, to power it. He trailed off, staring at Oliver uncertainly. Explain said Oliver. The scientist did so reluctantly, their guide had chosen their target well. He was the head researcher of the entire project, and was deeply familiar with every aspect of it. You said it brings people back to life as well, does it? asked Oliver, continuing to grasp for information. Yes, it does, the newest version that I just shared with you does. Oliver looked at Graves. I'm going to try something. I might be a few minutes. Just keep an eye on me, and don't let him get away. She nodded, hard eyes locked onto the scientist. Oliver didn't find himself feeling concerned that the scientist would try to get away. He glanced at Tyro, nodded when they made eye contact, then cast his mind into the underpinnings and searched for the spell, having just been granted the reference to it, the spell was directly before him as soon as he entered. He viewed the note. It was a simple thing to extract the technique and view its history, he was able to see each time the spell had been cast the chain of iterations having also been granted to him at the same time as the original, going all the way back to the very first time the spell was cast. That was unsurprising, given how he'd come to understand the underpinning to work. He could see the times the spell had been used to attempt to resurrect somebody, watched the times that it dragged some unsuspecting humans from who knows where into there, only for them to be dragged off by armed guards, under the watchful eye of the archmage. He watched as nameless horrors, inhuman yet clearly still sapient monsters all tentacles or crystalline planes or, in one notable case, a floating cloud, 
from places unknown were summoned into what was unmistakably a laboratory teeming with scientists, only to be killed or disposed of immediately. And he watched as time and time again human bodies were conjured up only to remain lifeless. Only in the last iteration spell had they managed to restore a man to life, a soldier who woke up screaming in the intensity of the battle rage only to find himself not where he had remembered himself to be, and Oliver watched as the man felt at his chest, shocked to find himself alive and whole. And watching this, the idea Oliver D. been resisting all this time out of an abundance of caution finally became too much to resist. He triggered that latest version of the spell, locking onto his memories of Gideon, hale and vibrant and alive, and felt mana flood out of him, more than he'd ever spent before yet still leaving his reserves undiminished. When it was done he left the underpinnings to the sounds of Graves and Tyro's exclamations of surprise, joined by the familiar timbre of Gideon's gravelly tones. The man himself stood with his back to Oliver conversing in shock with Graves and Tyro. Oliver had done it. The spell had worked. Before he could give himself a chance to question it, he went back into the underpinning where his mind still hovered before the spell and cast it several more times in quick succession, bringing back Tallahassee next, then Syndra, Galen, and finally Galen's friend who died on Oliver's account back in the city where they'd battled the Manor Hound and her companions. Alo. He opened his eyes again to find them all standing there, the up until recently deceased and their living friends, the former confused and the latter in tears. The scene was about what one would expect, the joyful reunion marred only by precarity of their present position, far from home in the mountains of Shadow Vale. But even that was of no concern to the joy of the reunion. It was only a matter of moments before Tallahassee demanded that he cast the spell again, naming Luke as the subject, her eyes shining with hope. Oliver spoke with the scientist, and the scientist granted Tallahassee the means of transferring memories. It had much in common with the means by which Oliver would review the castings of spells, a similar kind of suspension of the senses taking place while the memory played out. It was enough for him to cast the spell and return Luke to life, making their joy complete. The man turned out to be a thin IF pilot with a British accent and a rather cliché, yet still fashionable pencil-thin moustache above his upper lip. Tallahassee took him by the hand and led him off to reorient him to their current situation before Oliver could get a word in edgewise, her head held high with hope. Her glance back to him spoke of gratitude so profound it could not be voiced. Yet something in him knew she would try, and he felt that it was unwarranted, he merely had done what any man could do, though he was grateful the power of the doing had fallen to him, for it was a salve to his sore conscience to be able to make right some of the wrongs of this world. Oliver, meanwhile, felt that his mana reserves had fallen sufficiently that he was hesitant to restore any others to life, though he was sure there would be plenty more requests to follow. This world had been harsh to those of Earth. It left many open questions, could one be restored to life after having died of old age? There was much research to be done, and much magic to be learned, but even as his mind whirled down these tracks something else took precedent, and as the reborn Earthlings set up camp he took off by himself some distance from the epicenter of the activity. It was all well and good to be able to cast a single spell at a time dredged up from the depths of the underpinnings but he would need to be able to do more than that should the need arise. In order to return home, he was going to need to rebuild his system one final time. It would be, he realized in moments, quite impossible to restore his system. He had destroyed it, and believed it to be gone forever, and that belief had encoded itself into the spell without it destroying itself. That was why it had proven so efficient against the Archmage, a simple modification to the interface would have had little effect on somebody to whose own interface was such second nature. The Archmage's belief of its existence would have overruled his own dot but what he had done was far more destructive, he had rewritten the system spell to remove the interface that had painstakingly evolved over centuries of natural selection, failure, and iterative improvements. Even the original system spell had a rudimentary way of controlling and using the spell forms it contained, but his had none. In essence, he hadn't just modified the steering wheel of the car, he had removed it entirely. Ultimately, it mattered little. Through the underpinnings, Oliver still had access to the Phoenix Wright spell, it would return him to a particular point in time, 
according to the scientist, and that was enough. Oliver found that now he had discharged his duty of conscience towards the moderate group, and to his allies of convenience, he wanted nothing more than to return home, all the more so since the means was now within his grasp. The prisoners he had rescued, too, needed modern medical care desperately. Thus it was with little difficulty that he formed a resolution of returning home immediately, before anything further could disrupt his personal mission. And once he had resolved this, it could not happen too soon. Full of trepidation of the unknown, and anxiety now that his goal was so close to being achieved, he went directly to Gideon and Syndra. He found found them in close conversation, heads perhaps closer together than merely being allies would have warranted. Even before he asked his question, he already knew the answer. Go back, asked Gideon. No, I'm not thinking I will. The cancer in my blood this world's magic is the only thing keeping me alive. But a sideways glance at Syndra proved that wasn't the only thing keeping him here. Oliver then explained his intent of returning alone to Gideon, giving the justification that his work here was already done. He explained the benefits and drawbacks of the null system spell which he'd crafted, how it would render any who took it unable to cast other spells by destroying their interface but how it was also powerful enough to destroy even an archmage in the height of their power and within the influence of a manor well. This is a powerful weapon indeed said Syndra, after overcoming her incredulity at its potency, if we were to, say, get to, a system hub finished Gideon, we'd be able to corrupt the system instance that that hub distributes out to everybody during a census. And given the self-replicating nature of the system and its hubs, it should spread like wildfire said Oliver. But that, that would completely destabilize our entire civilization said Syndra, a solemnity settling over her features as she contemplated the implications. And isn't that exactly what you've, we've, been trying to do, asked Oliver. Yes, yes it is she admitted. It certainly would upset the power structure. It's perhaps the one thing that might achieve our goals without further loss of life. But, the system, its means of controlling spells, that is what enabled humanity to rise from the dark times of the wild magic. We'd be throwing ourselves backwards into an even darker time. This would be no revolution. It's an apocalypse. Not so said Oliver. Magic is still controlled by the system, interface or no. It still absorbs mana, prevents wild castings, structures your natural magic. It just prevents it from being ordered in a structured way. The energy is still there, still being spent, you just can't access it. At least, not yet. Life, without magic. She looked aghast at the very thought. Gideon chuckled. We've managed it for thousands of years back home. It's not as bad as you might think. And that's not to say you'll never be able to get it back either said Oliver. It'll just take you a little while. In time, you will regain your magic. Once your civilizations have caught up to where we are on Earth, when you understand each other, and the world you live in, enough, the system will once more become available to you. How can this be? asked Syndra, looking confused. Oliver stood for a moment thinking of his experience with modeling the underpinnings in a way that wouldn't obliterate his mind. It had only been possible because of the shared and pooled knowledge of Earth's humanity. A knowledge achieved through hundreds of years of humankind working in concert towards shared ends in times of relative peace. Knowledge born of true civilization which could only come from empathy and the development of a philosophy of humanity that valued each human life and the dignity thereof. Once the people of this place had reached that point, built up similar levels of abstraction and meaning, the system would be understandable to them as well. And if they were able to reach that point, it would mean that they had already achieved that which Earth had, some form of global peace and cooperation that would mean the magic wouldn't destroy them. Was it enough of a safeguard? Oliver couldn't say, but he hoped so, and in any case it was the best he could do. But how to communicate all that? Never mind she said, seeing that he didn't have a ready response. I'll take your word for it. He acknowledged this gracefully, choosing to accept her faith in his assertion rather than attempt to explain his reasoning to her. He turned to Gideon. Is this enough? 
Will you be all right? After having spent so long in confidence with him, Oliver was sure the big man would do the right thing, would know how to leverage the null system to the greatest effect possible. More than enough. You've done the impossible. I'd ask you to stay further, if I could said Gideon, but instead, I can only wish you the best. You're doing the right thing. Go home to your wife and child. They shook hands, and Oliver parted ways with them, leaving them to their discussion, left with the lasting impression of Gideon's confidence and trusting in his discernment of the man's intentions and abilities. After speaking with the two of them, Oliver then went to Tallahassee, who was still talking with Luke. Home. This, this is home for me now she said with an expression of realization, and Luke nodded. Besides she continued, gaining momentum, who would look after Sung Lee if we leave? He'll get himself killed straight away on his own. And we all know he's not going back. He's far too invested in his research here. Graves, it transpired, would be returning alongside him, the scientific discoveries she was the sole witness of, enabled by magic, would save countless lives on Earth. Besides she said in her thick northern English accent, there's bound to be a way back so it's not like I'll be stuck in Normaville forever. The rest of the Earthers would also be coming with Oliver, naturally, there wasn't even the need to consult them, nor the will. At present, they were left consoling one another or sitting in shock inside the storage space within the ring, the moderates in this mountain range lacked the supplies to feed and clothe such a group. No, the only thing that would do for them would be to travel home with Oliver where they could receive proper care and medical attention. And as it would be no extra cost to return them within the ring, Oliver was resolved to do so. Sorry about the whole, you know, bar fight and lying to you when we first met things said Tyro with a lopsided grin. He'd been seated by a fire in conference with Gallen and Ullo when Oliver approached with the news of his impending departure. I understand was all Oliver said. He retained a certain dissatisfaction with the way Tyro had deceived him, but could not particularly blame him, he was merely playing the role of responsible revolutionary, a role he had been forced into by an unjust society with which Oliver took the greater exception. Though it did not excuse him entirely, it did leave Oliver unable to indulge in unmitigated resentment. Great, great said Tyro. I'm glad we can still be friends. Oliver gave him a smile but said nothing, and moved on. I'm indebted to you for saving my life he said to Olo with some awkwardness. I don't know how to thank you. Bah, I didn't do it for you said Olo. Tyro tells me you came up with a way to level the playing field. Says you knocked off an archmage, and you with only a few months of knowing magic. It's true said Oliver, inclining his head. Then it was worth it Olo said. After a pause, he added, and you did return the favor. So I guess that makes us even. Without waiting for a response, he turned back to the fire, a haunted look in his eyes. Dot, and that was it. Oliver said the rest of his goodbyes, precious few that they were, and withdrew into the underpinnings to locate the Phoenix Rite spell once more. It was a matter of some difficulty to locate it once more, but buoyed by the second wind spell, he was able to sort through the visions in time his mind handling the influx of experiences with an ease granted by much exposure. After finding the correct spell, he held it within his mind as he returned his consciousness to the present moment, looking around at the people around him. The only person standing by him was Graves, and she was neither particularly dear to him nor did she bear any special regard for him, so he felt quite unattached. He passed the spell on to her, and she took it, assuring him of her gratitude once more, and quite unnecessarily at that dot Oliver found that there was a touch of moroseness in his spirit as he adjusted the Phoenix Rite spell, fixing in his mind the time and place from which it had carried him so many months ago, a time and place from which he now felt quite divorced and yet had never more longed for, as imminent as its recovery was dot beside him, Graves did the same, and as she was the first to trigger the spell, he was privileged to observe her vanish between eye blinks. One moment she was there, and the next she was simply gone and he was left looking down the mountainside at a view that had been until now obscured by her form. He gazed out over the snowy mountain range, 
taking in the grandeur of this magical world for what was almost certainly the last time. A lingering regret rose to his attention, the magic he'd had a hand in destroying held so much promise, the promise of power that he could have wielded bittersweet in his mind. And yet his heart was unswayed in its desire to return home, so there was really no internal debate at all. Indeed, looking back, there never had been, though the promise of magic had greatly occupied his attention and his imagination, his heart and his actions had been fully aligned, from the very first day he'd found himself transported to this world. Besides, it was enough of a consolation to him to know that he'd had a part to play in saving it from certain destruction at its own hands. Though it was not his role to be the one to see the destruction of the system carried out to its fullest extent, and never had been, Oliver was no doubt the principal means by which its salvation had been attained. And that gratified him greatly, an atonement, of sorts. The butcher's bill was finally paid in full. It was with his heart and mind conflicted in these mixed feelings, yet on the whole over full of joyful anticipation that he prepared to trigger the spell. He stood there for a moment, then with a gasp of anticipating he powered the spell. Immediately the familiar vortex of lights and sounds appeared. He relaxed, allowing it to pull him forward into the unknown. One moment, he was standing on the mountainside, looking over the group of people and possibly the world, that he'd saved, the next, he was surrounded by colors and shapes flashing by faster than he could perceive them. In time, they became interspersed by flashes of blinding white light, which in turn faded away into an all-encompassing and now deeply familiar dark void. Then he waited. A Saturday's afternoon in New Hampshire, hot the sun beating down from overhead, blue and cloudless the sky. Green the suburban grass lawn, and trim, and sweaty the man employed in wielding a weed whacker against the weeds at its edge. Oliver finished the last of the trimming and wiped his forehead, the bright orange gloves he was wearing leaving a smear of dirt across his forehead. He didn't notice. Behind him, a grill was smoking, the aroma of sizzling hamburger filling drifting through the suburb from yard to yard. He looked back to the yard, opened his mouth to say something to his wife who was just then coming out of the air-conditioned house and onto the porch. Then he disappeared without a trace, leaving nothing behind, not even his gear. The woman glanced over, confused, one hand holding a plate and the other resting on her stomach unconsciously. A half moment later, before she even had time to notice his absence, Oliver reappeared, dressed in drab monk-like robes wearing strange jewellery, and with an unaccountably long beard that looked to have been at least six months in the growing. Further, his weed whacker was nowhere in sight. He sank to his knees at the sight of her, the strength deserting his limbs, smiling through the tears, and mumbled something through his beard inaudibly. She glanced over and shouted, What? I didn't hear you. Then she screwed up her face in confusion at the sight of him. I'm home he shouted again, louder. I'm home. Oliver, what are you talking about? What are you wearing? And what on earth is that on your face? She called back in some annoyance and confusion, setting down the plate and hurrying over to him as fast as her pregnant figure would permit. On earth he whispered one more time in disbelief as she reached him and he sprang up and swept her into a tight embrace. I'm home. Not understanding but sensing his distress, she returned his embrace tightly, and in that moment, all was right for Oliver Grace, 